All right, guys, welcome back. Uh, today's lecture is for Tuesday, April 7th. Yesterday we talked about the progression, progression of war in the Pacific Ocean, uh, talking about the Americans turning away the Japanese at the Battle of Midway Island, and then progressively taking over uh, islands in the South Pacific before reaching the Philippines and retaking the Philippines. Uh, now, the Americans or the Allies find themselves in a position where previously uh, President Franklin Roosevelt had talked about how he would accept nothing but unconditional surrender. Unconditional surrender being no concessions made, uh, no, uh, you know, politicking each other on both sides. Um, unconditional surrender is where the winner tells the loser how it is going to be and there will be no middle ground. There will be no, um, you know, concessions. So after he says that, that means they can't just bag Japan into a corner and say, okay, now do you quit? Like say uncle. No, they, they can't do that. They have forced themselves in a situation where they need to completely and utterly defeat Japan. And scorched earth if it's got to be, but they have to completely take them. And that will require probably an invasion of Japan. Now, as we've learned in world history, invading islands is hard, especially really populated islands such as Japan or Great Britain. So that comes with a lot of risk, but also, the fact that Japan is not just one island, or even just two islands, or three. They are a chain of islands. And so they're going to need to take each island one by one. And one of the first Japanese main islands is an island known as Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima was an interesting case because the island was basically all for military. It only had a couple thousand civilians on the island. It was not a heavily populated place. So what does America stand to gain from taking the island? Well, Iwo Jima, it, this would be a lot easier if I had a map to show you. Actually, let's... There, that's a little better. Um, Iwo Jima was about six hours away from the Japanese mainland. And it was almost in a direct line with any kind of, um, any kind of route to Japan by air or by sea. Iwo Jima is a little island right here in the Pacific. So there's Japan. U.S. is way over here to the right. So Iwo Jima was kind of an early warning system. Any planes that were headed to Iwo Jima or to Japan or any ships, they would be noticed in Iwo Jima by radar, which had a wide stretch, so they could really, there was no way around it. Um, and so they could tip off the Japanese mainland that, hey, something's coming. So if they were going to, if the Allies were going to take uh, Japan or perform an invasion, they needed to take Iwo Jima. And the Battle of Iwo Jima is just a mess. The, the island is the most, known as the most heavily fortified place on Earth. Bunkers and underground trenches and tunnels and all kinds of a uh, complex defense system set in, and the Allies bombed overhead and then planned on 
uh, doing a bunch of damage with bombers and then coming ashore and marching onto the sea. But the problem was those bombers did nothing because they all the soldiers were down in bunkers and in tunnels underground. Like all it did was rearrange dirt. So when the Allied soldiers come ashore, they're met with a full strength Japanese army. Um, but that army was still smaller than the mostly American Marines that came on on shore and they fought over every piece of that island like they fought completely all to exhaustion here's the thing about battling for an island and especially with the way the japanese fight there's no retreating there's no look can you let us board the ship real quick so we can leave and go home any island Japan was going, or the Allies were going to take from Japan, they would have to fight to the death for. Japan suffered uh, mass casualties. This they get outnumbered. Like it, they fight valiantly, it is tough, but it's it's not going to be winnable for the Japanese. They just don't have a way. Not enough people. Um, They'd run out of oil and a lot of supplies. They were kind of just sit, sitting ducks in those bunkers. Um, and it's just, it's a mess. Allies suffer 26,000 casualties. Remember, casualties are dead and wounded and captured combined. So 7,000 allies died in battle. Another 19 are wounded, uh, or 19,000 plus some captives, but those are killed before the end of the battle. Um, so 26,000 casualties, 7,000 dead. Japan suffers 18,000 dead. How many casualties? About 18,000. They didn't have wounded that left the island. They didn't have wounded or captured prisoners. They didn't allow themselves to be captured. Japanese society and Japanese military code called for death before dishonor. And capture was considered dishonor to them. So they would charge into an open battlefield with no weapon before they would sit and wait to be taken prisoner. So 18,000 die. And this photograph down in the bottom here, it's to this day the single most printed image or photograph in American history. It's the planting of the flag atop Mount Siribachi in, Japan, in Iwo Jima. This is by American Marines. They get to the high point or the high ground in Iwo Jima, which is high ground is always considered the most valuable of battleground. And they hoist the flag marking their territory and the progress of their island takeover. Now they still had a long ways to go even after this because the rest of the island, they would fight, the Japanese would fight for every acre. So it's bloody, it's messy, and even I think there's six, six Marines here that hoist this flag. I think three of them die the next day in battle. Only two of them, I think, made it home after the war. So this is a long, drawn-out, bloody battle. But it is won by the Allies, and they are just one island closer to Japan. Importantly, they take out that big war early warning system. Now, to flip it back to Europe... 
we're going to go over possibly my favorite battle in human history. The Battle of Stalingrad. Uh, this is between the Germans and the Soviets. Now, the Germans called this branch of their army, they sent the 6th Army, or 6th Regiment. This was known as the Panzer Army, P-A-N-Z-E-R. The Panzer Army, was it's named after its commander. Um, they were probably the most admired and respected of German soldiers. The Soviets called their army as a whole the Red Army. Red is typically the color of communism. So... They were known as the Red Army. So I'm going to, I'll refer to the two sides as those two things, so don't get confused. The Panzer Army is German, the Red Army is Soviet. So Stalingrad was seen as the most important city in the Soviet Union for multiple reasons. One, it's the namesake of the leader of the Soviet Union. Joseph Stalin renamed uh, I believe it was, oh shoot, I don't even remember the original name of the city now, um, Volgograd, that's it. He renamed the city of Volgograd Stalingrad. This was the new capital as well. Um, the Germans had made progress into the Soviet Union. They'd gained land. The next obvious site for battle was going to be Stalingrad. Now, in a lot of cases, when warfare is about to hit a city, the government will evacuate the civilians, or at least tell the civilians, hey, you might want to find a train out. It's about to get messy here. Stalin did not do that. Joseph Stalin told the citizens of Stalingrad, no, stay back, stay home. Why? Well, A, he thought that the presence of civilians would motivate the Red Army to fight harder for its people. And B, well, if things turn bad and we run out of soldiers and are desperate, we can just give the civilians guns and tell them to defend their homes. And that's exactly what happens. The Germans make a big push. Another reason Stalingrad was important was because there's a river right behind it known as the Volga River. The Volga River had access to the Mediterranean Sea, which was, it's that body of water that sits between Africa and Europe. And that sea was the major trading port for the Soviets. Like that's how they were getting the materials from trade such as the Lend-Lease Act. But they are that, river is essential. The Germans' plan is to take Stalingrad, take the river, cut the Soviets off from any trade or any materials outside. If they take Stalingrad, they may just win the war. Well, battle is pushed into the city of Stalingrad, and Germany takes the city after gruesome, brutal, brutal warfare. They, they end up taking the city, but it, I mean, they get into the city and soldiers are hiding out in houses and apartment buildings, and they're literally fighting each other in the living rooms of these, of these homes, fighting each other room by room. Uh, once the Germans took, say, let's say they take an apartment building, like a 10-story apartment complex. Well, then the Soviets are standing outside trying to retake the building. And one of my favorite anecd anecdotes is how the Soviets would shoot grenade or throw grenades up at the window. And upon... Um, hitting the floor, if they got it through the window, it'd explode, kill the soldiers in there. So the Germans combat that by covering the windows with chicken wire. Couldn't close the windows because they're shot out from battle. So they cover the windows with chicken wire. Genius. They can't get in, and grenades probably aren't going to be thrown hard enough 
to explode on contact with chicken wire that probably fall to the ground and blow up on the ground, killing the soldiers that threw them. So what do the Soviets do? Well, they take those grenades and they atti- uh, attach fishing hooks or hooks to them. And then they'll throw them with the chicken wire and those hooks will get caught on the fence. And then if it doesn't blow up on contact with the fence, then they'll just aim their guns at it and shoot it and blow it up while it's right outside the window. Not a huge deal, but I just found that fascinating. That's pretty genius. I don't know if I would have thought of that. So the Germans end up taking the city of Stalingrad, but the Soviets don't leave and don't give up. They surround the city. The government's vacated the city. They're operating from another town. But they decide to send more reinforcements around Stalingrad, and the Soviets surround the entire city, blocking the Germans from getting any supplies. This attack starts in September. Or, or excuse me, sorry. Um, Oh, my dates are off. This is messed up. That's supposed to say November of 1943. Ooh. Or sorry. No, no. Hold on. I'm all thrown off. My mistake. The original date is supposed to say September of 1942. Let me change that right now. Boom. Sorry, that is an oversight on my part. In September of 1942, Germans entered the city of Stalingrad. Um, And then by November, the Soviets had surrounded the German army and basically strangled them within the city. And they couldn't retake the city, not yet, but they'd surrounded it, making it so the Germans couldn't go anywhere. Now, think about the weather in Kansas in November and then December and into January. It's pretty cold, right? We'll get some snow days every once in a while. It can be brisk. There can be a nice, uh, strong north wind bringing temperatures down below freezing, right? Okay, now think about Russia. And what you know about the climate of Russia in November and December and into January. The Germans, Adolf Hitler specifically, just committed the cardinal sin of history. Don't invade Russia in the winter. They did not plan for the winter. They didn't bring any warm coats. They were still in their normal September attire. And it gets cold. And Stalin, before Germany took the city, Stalin burned all of the grain in the city of Stalingrad all the bread, all the corn, anything that could be eaten within the city was burned. And the Germans take the city and they find no food there. And they find no more weapons. And they cannot leave. Germans get desperate. Um, The Soviets slowly move into the city forcing the German, the Panzer Army into small pockets and kind of like splintering them off from each other in different parts of the city. And Hitler was told about this situation and he was asked by the commander in Stalingrad, can we please sign a surrender, at least in the city, not not the whole war, just the battle. Can we please sign a surrender? We are Morale is low. We have no food. We have no clothes. We have no hope. Can we please sign 
a surrender. They'll take us into custody. We'll be prisoners of war. Can we please do that? Hitler refuses. Because Germany hadn't been defeated hardly at all in World War II. Like the Battle of Britain, kind of. But even then, he didn't have to admit to the people, to the German people that he lost. He wasn't about to take a surrender. So he said, nope, fight to the death. Every last one of you. I don't care if every one of you dies, fight. Well, then they do, they fight a little longer, but then they finally get exhausted and the in the lead officer in Stalingrad for the Panzer Army takes it upon himself to surrender. And the remaining Panzer Army is taken in as prisoners, which being a Soviet prisoner of war, not as luxurious as you may think. Um, you're still stuck in the cold. You're not given another coat. You're fed a little bit, not much. But it was not a very pleasant situation. And Hitler's furious about the loss. And this is, the Battle of Stalingrad was the first loss that the Germans had to admit to their people. Like they had to tell the people, uh, yeah, we didn't take Stalingrad. You couldn't hide it. You couldn't say, well, we got bored. Or, well, we decided the city wasn't as important as we thought. No, it, you can't play that off. And now, Joseph Stalin's about to start his campaign against the Germans. It's a campaign of fear. Here's a crazy thing. I don't think it has anything to do with the Battle of Stalingrad necessarily. But um, Joseph Stalin's son was in the Red Army. He was a Soviet soldier. Earlier in the war, he had been taken prisoner. His troop had been ambushed, and he'd been taken prisoner. And the Germans found out who he was, and they decided, hey, here's a chance to negotiate. So Hitler hits up Stalin, says, hey, we've got your son prisoner. We're willing to make a trade. We'll trade his life for, we'll say, like 10 or 20 German soldiers that are imprisoned in Soviet camps. And Stalin says, no. Hitler says, we're not messing around. We're going we're gonna to exterminate these Soviet soldiers. If you don't make this deal, we're going to kill them. And Stalin says, nope. Hitler's like, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I'm not messing around. I'll actually do it. And Stalin says, do it. And so Hitler does. Stalin refused to trade the lives of German soldiers for his son's life because he thought that would show weakness. He thought that would make him seem like a common and simple person. And that was not what he was about. Just as Stalin wanted to be the ultimate ruler of the Soviet Union. He wanted people to fear him and respect him. And he he thought by making a deal for his son's life that that would be compromised. People say Adolf Hitler is the craziest person that ever lived. I think Joseph Stalin gives him a run for his money. I mean, he was nicknamed the man with an iron heart. He was that crazy. So that's the Battle of Stalingrad, and that's the turning point in Europe, because from there, the Soviet, the Allies in general, but especially the Soviets, get some momentum. This was not going to be like World War I, where they're exhausted and forced to surrender. They now have momentum and an ability to flip the war around and take it to the Germans, and that is what they are going to do. Today's essential question is why did America want to invade a lowly populated island like Iwo Jima? Meaning, what was the benefit of taking Iwo Jima? If there weren't that many people living on it, why do they need the island? It's posted in the notes. I talked about it. Uh, so, that's your question. You just answer it on the same document you answered yesterday's question on. Go to Tuesday, put the question in. Type your answer.
So that'll be it for today. Um, appreciate you guys listening to this and have a terrific rest of your day.